Still no response from trapped miners as rescuers finish the first ventilation hole and a congressman calls for an investigation. EPA's tailoring rule could be out by the end of the month, what it means for industry. And a senator and a governor team up to try to expand clean energy tax credits. From the Energy News Center in Washington, D.C., this is the Energy Report with Susan McGinnis. Good morning, I'm Susan McGinnis. Thanks for joining us for the Energy Report on the seventh day of April 2010. Searchers in West Virginia have successfully completed drilling the first of four ventilation holes much earlier than expected. But after banging on pipes lowered into the hole, workers heard nothing back, indicating surviving miners in the upper Big Branch coal mine. Monday's massive explosion killed 25 miners, left the whereabouts of four others unknown. The first completed hole was in an area officials hope the miners took to seek refuge from toxic gases. It's about a football field's length away from the rescue chamber. Miners are trained that when they hear shots go off on the surface to pound on the mine roof. Now naturally if they're in a refuge alternative or a chamber they won't be pounding on the mine roof but they will be pounding on the top of a refuge chamber. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday it's very sketchy. It's very uh, it's a very much a long shot as well because of the, the overburden that we're talking here, the 1,093 feet. That's, that's a large distance for people on the surface to be able to detect someone pounding, not, not on a mine roof in this case, on the roof of a refuge chamber. But it's something uh, that we think is important to at least try to do. Today's going to be a big day. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, we'll have more knowledge than what we have right now. And, and, uh, and we want to be as helpful as we can to the families and support it, and we appreciate that very much. And questions continue about the safety record of the mine's operator, Massey Energy. West Virginia Congressman Nick Rahal has called for congressional hearings on this accident. His request has been granted by Labor Committee Chairman George Miller. At issue, what more laws might be needed or stricter enforcement of those on the books in a 2006 mine safety law. Also increased fines from that law that have been fought in court by mining companies, including Massey. One more issue, has Massey Energy acted appropriately and notifying family members of the accident, something the company has been sharply criticized for uh, in this and past accidents. Congressman Ray Hall says he sees the same pattern with this explosion. There's a better outreach effort here. There's a better public relations. There's a better strategy or whatever. Anything is better than what has been emanating from the company thus far. And you're right, this is the same pattern they've shown in past disasters as well. And we'll have more on the Upper Big Branch coal mine disaster on this week's edition of Clean Skies Sunday. Clean Skies' Lee Patrick Sullivan looks into Massey's safety record and more. EPA officials are working to finish up the tailoring rule by the end of this month. That word came from Gina McCarthy, the Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation. She told the Energy Information Administration's spring conference in Washington both industry and government officials are eager to find out which power plants and other emission sources will be regulated under the Clean Air Act. I'm actually anxiously trying to deliver it um, because I think it's a tremendously deliberative document. Um, that will make sense to people when they read it, that will take some of the fear away about what permitting requirements are going to be required when, uh, but the administrators already made it clear that when we kick in in January, we're going to look at greenhouse gases only when we have sources that are in the uh, permitting process as a result of triggering um, criteria pollutant thresholds. And McCarthy says there is a chance the release could be pushed to early May. The new rule won't take effect before next January and then for only the largest emitters. Others will be phased in over time. In the meantime, we could soon know the details of the legislative approach to curbing carbon emissions. Former Obama policy advisor Jason Grimay now says that Majority Leader Harry Reid has told the authors of the Senate climate bill, John Kerry, Doe Lieberman and Lindsey Graham, that he wants their long-awaited legislation by April 20th. There has been speculation, especially from Senator Graham, that the recent health care votes could poison the well for the rest of the year, effectively ending any chance to pass a climate bill. But former Al Gore policy advisor Elaine Kmark, now with the U.S. Climate Task Force, told Clean Skies News Tyler Suter's health care may have helped Senate climate talks. If we'd done this, this conversation two months ago, the consensus was, oh, health care has killed climate change. You know, there's just no oxygen left in the room 
for climate change. And part of that is the nature uh, under which that bill was pushed through. Mm -hmm. Now I think it, it's actually, I, I think people are having a little different opinion, which is that the health care um, hiatus for climate change actually gave people a chance to step back and think about what the problems were with the original bill. And they also discuss why Kmart's group prefers a carbon tax shift approach to pricing carbon and how that jives with the cap and dividend plan that may be part of the Senate climate bill. Their entire conversation is right here at cleanskies.com. A senator and a governor want a tax credit expanded for companies making clean energy equipment. Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown and Governor Ted Strickland want Congress to expand the advanced energy manufacturing tax credit that was part of the stimulus package. It gives a 30 percent tax credit for investments in new, expanded or re-equipped advanced energy manufacturing projects. Brown wants Congress to add five billion dollars to the program. Eighteen governors, in addition to Strickland, have written the president in support of the program. They plan to meet today in Ohio with officials in the advanced energy business. The Secretary of Energy gives an endorsement to natural gas drilling technologies and the future for reserves. Stephen Chu said in a speech at that EIA conference, U.S. natural gas reserves may have doubled thanks to new drilling technologies. He said that's a big deal because gas will be a transition fuel as we go to renewables. EIA said that proved reserves were 244.7 trillion cubic feet at the end of 2008. Chu also said U.S. technologies like clean coal and carbon sequestration will have a significant impact with the U.S. investing $4 billion in CCS technologies matched by $7 billion in private sector money. And he said nuclear reactors will be part of the future with small modular reactors having many advantages. The World Bank votes tomorrow on a $3.75 billion loan to South Africa, most of it to help build the world's seventh biggest coal plant. Construction is underway and South African officials say this plant is desperately needed to help South Africa's economy. The U.S. is the bank's largest shareholder and has been fighting coal-fired projects in developing nations. It holds a key vote on this loan, which also happens to include $745 million for wind and solar power. Without the loan, South Africa would have to turn to the commercial markets for finance. China's move into wind energy is picking up as its first offshore wind farm is expected to reach full power within weeks. This 102 megawatt Shanghai project is the first of several offshore wind projects planned there. Four more large-scale offshore farms are planned that officials say could generate 1,000 megawatts of electricity. Energy consultants Azure International predict that by 2020, China will have invested $100 billion to install 30,000 megawatts of capacity off of China's coast. Officials say initial focus will be on tidal flats north of Shanghai, which has 10,000 megawatts of wind power potential. Here's a look at goings on around the Beltway today. At 9 a.m. EIA holds a conference in the Reagan Building on smart grid technology. Clean Skies News is there. 1.30, FERC Commissioner John Norris talks about the smart grid and exhibitors will give demonstrations of smart grid technology devices. That's the Energy Report. Thanks for joining us in the Energy News Center. For any suggestions or comments about our programming on Clean Skies News, you can email us at contact at cleanskies.com, and you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Susan McGinnis. You're watching Clean Skies News.